Hello, my name is Ronald F. Day. I'm the Vice President of Programs at the Fortune Society. Welcome to Both Sides of the Bars, a discussion-driven show that examines the legal system from various perspectives, including people most impacted. During each episode, we discuss critical questions about how the current system operates, momentum for change within social justice movements, and the impact these issues have on the lives of everyone that they affect. We ask you, the viewers, to spread the word about both sides of the bars and share your comments about today's episodes with us on Twitter using at the Fortune SOC. Today's show is titled A Spotlight on Mass Supervision, Rethinking Technical Violations. Here with me today are two experts on this issue. Tanya Pierce, thank you for joining us, and Vincent Chiraldi, who is known very well as Vinny. Tanya is the co-founder and president of Life Unbolted, and Vinny Chiraldi is senior research scientist at the Columbia School of Social Work and co-director of the Columbia Justice Lab. We know that for the most part, there's been a discussion around mass incarceration we've talked much less in our community about mass supervision. A lot of people end up in our jails, they aren't necessarily on post-release supervision, but many people who end up in our prisons, and the majority of people who are in the system are in our prisons, as we know. But a lot of these individuals end up transitioning to post-release supervision. Whether you're in federal custody or state custody, you're oftentimes on supervision a lot of these folks are ending up violated based upon conditions, very petty conditions, non-criminal offenses. We want to shed some light on this particular issue. Great. So we feel we're going to have a great conversation with you. And I want to start with you, Vinny, because you've done a significant amount of research around this particular issue, not just in New York, but around the country. Right. So you can set the context for what's happening around post-release supervision with respect to violations, right. the cost of it, the human impact of it, et cetera. I think it would be good to hear that. Great. Well, thanks for having me on, Ron. I of really course, appreciate it's our it. It's great to be on with you, Tanya. Um, so think of, let's just go back for a second. The, these both probation and parole in the U.S. started in the 1800s, yeah. and they were unabashedly merciful. Mm -hmm. They were focused on individuals trying to turn people's lives around, and they pretty much existed that way all the way up to the 1970s when we launched the war on drugs, the war on crime, and we started mass incarceration. And what happened then is the notion was that nothing works when it comes to rehabilitating folks, mm -hmm. right? A notion you can only have about other people, by the way, yeah. not about your own child, let's say, right? You'd never think that about your own mm -hmm. kid. And so at that point, prisons had something to fall back on. They had punishment, they, had, they were warehouses, Probation and parole really didn't have anything to fall back on. They were only about rehabilitation at that point. Mm -hmm. So they pivoted and they started to follow their big brother to prison and became more punitive, more about surveillance, mm -hmm. more about locking people up. They started calling themselves community corrections, slapping electronic monitors on mm -hmm. people. And they, it worked. They grew massively, fourfold since that time. But the money didn't grow. So now you got POs with massive caseloads, no money to really help the people who might need housing or education or jobs, no, no resources for that, or very few resources for that. So what started happening is that they used the resource they had, prison. That was always available. You could, maybe you couldn't find a drug treatment program or a job program for people, but you can always find a prison cell. And so now we've got 4.5 million people under supervision probation or parole. That does not fall equally across all races and classes. People of color are way more likely to be under supervision. One out of 55 people in America is under supervision. One out of 12 black men. And about a quarter of everybody going to prison every year is going not for a new crime, but for a purely technical violation. In New York, just as one example, if you talk, think about parole, probation is an alternative to getting locked up, or at least it was designed to be that. Parole is advancing, was originally designed to advance people's release 
if they behaved well in prison, right? That was, that's the difference for folks who don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, in New York, everybody who leaves prison, depressingly, comes back within three years. But four out of five of the people come back, come back for a technical parole violation, not for a new crime. So if you just want to kind of think about what kind of impact this has on people's lives. Got it. It's that kind of impact. Got it. And can you, before we turn to you, Tanya, to give some personal experience about it, what are some of the reasons that people end up going back for? Yeah, good, good question. So technical violations would include missing appointments, using drugs, um, uh, moving without telling your parole officer or your probation officer, staying out past curfew, associating with people with a criminal record, and many of them are established with good intent, by the way. The notion that people who have committed crimes might not want to hang out with other people who have committed crimes, it, it does not, it's not nonsensical. But then when you start to look at the numbers and one out of 12 black men is under supervision and one out of three black men has a felony record in America, how are you going to live in Brownsville or Harlem or some of these neighborhoods that are, have heavy numbers of people of color in them without associating? And so you then set up a situation where the parole officer or the probation officer can violate pretty much anyone. Got it. And that's really important to understand the numbers, but also the reasons why people end up going back. And Tanya, you were in a situation that I think would be very much enlightening for people. So why don't you tell us a, you know, a little bit about yourself and how this particular issue has impacted you. Hi, thanks for having me, Ronald. Of course, thanks it's a for pleasure. Thank you, Randy. Hi, my name is Tanya. I was sentenced to three years in Danbury Federal Prison. Um, I served 20 months in Danbury and I served six months at the Brooklyn Halfway House. Um, on set, when I arrived at the Halfway House, that was when I knew that violating parole, probation, that's what we have in the halfway house, in the federal system, was very easy. The notion of going to work and getting your life back on track is very difficult there because once they ex uh, explain the rules, you start to feel the trauma, that this is going to be a hardship. Um, one of the traumas that begin is you must find a job within 14 days or you are subjected to possibly being sent back. Um, second, once you find a job, you have to pay 25% of your gross. Now, for that reason alone, I saw people go back weekly. It was a regular occurrence in the Brooklyn Halfway House. Unfortunately for us women, they didn't have a, a space for the U.S. Marshal to come and take out who they was returning. They would take us women out every morning at a drop of a hat and keep us locked out of the room from anywhere from 60 minutes to an hour and a half. This was second nature. Once a week, twice a week, whenever the U.S. Marshals came. And it was mostly primarily because people just couldn't afford to pay 25% of their gross to the halfway house because now you no longer have car fare, you don't have dinner money. Even though the halfway house is supposed to provide that, sometimes you come in a little later from work, the kitchen is closed. Mm -hmm. um, there's, it doesn't compensate for people who work in Long Island where you have to pay mass transit, then you have to pay the Long Island Railroad. Mm -hmm. After giving them 25%, there's nothing left. And that would, within two weeks, you're likely to be sent back without paying subsistence. We haven't been able to determine from the evidence that the halfway houses do much better for people than them just being released into the community. And as you're saying, I mean, you said when we had another conversation that it was almost better being in prison than being in the halfway house. And that's like unthinkable. You think you're making a transition and you want to make your life better as you prepare for your ultimate release to the community. Right, it's the trauma. It's the trauma, it's the fear of constant fear from the time after you get your intake until you are off the ankle monitor. You live in constant fear. Mm -hmm. When I was on the ankle monitor at home, during the night I would be called three or four times. Now how am I supposed to get up and go to work at 6 a.m. if I'm called from 7 p.m. when I get home, 9.30, 11, 
12 something, 3 a.m., 5 a.m., when do I sleep? After, after a while, it takes a toll on you. You start, sleep deprivation kicks in mm -hmm. and you start to feel like, I can't make it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that sounds pretty like crazy yeah. then for someone to be subjected to constant calls when they know where the individual is, the monitoring, et cetera. That's and, you have, and you have to speak on the telephone and you have to give your full number. So at 3 a.m., you have to say your full name and your, and your numbers in your dead of sleep. So you can't even just say hi and fall you, back to sleep. You no, have to get up and you have to interact. get up yeah. and they have to have like a full conscious voice, not just sleepy groggy voice, yeah. your full voice with your name and your numbers. Got it. And everybody is exposed to that who's yes. on yeah. home confinement. On home confinement. Got it. So and I think it, it's kind of good to like think about like how do, how do we get to this yeah, place, to this right? Point, and yeah. you know, I was commissioner of probation in New York City, which is one of the biggest probation departments in the country. Yeah. And folks didn't come to those jobs to want to do bad stuff to yeah. people. They didn't even come to work every day to want to do bad stuff to people. but. You know, you had this thing that originally was about rehabilitation, and then over time, you get more and more people added to your caseload, mm -hmm. not more and more resources. That's what's happening to you if you're a PO. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the rest of the world is getting unfriendlier and unfriendlier to people on probation and parole with felony convictions. You can't move into public housing. You can't get this job. You can't get that job. You can't get this license. Mm -hmm. All sorts of stuff is happening. So mm -hmm. this is all combining to the perfect storm. And now you're a PO with lots of people on your caseload and not a lot of resources and a lot of problems. It's an incredibly stressful job. Mm -hmm. And what, what struck me was, if you're a PO and you've got somebody on your caseload that maybe they've messed up, they've missed a couple of appointments, they've been tested dirty once or mm -hmm. twice, you have to ask yourself a question. If I take a chance on this person and they go out and live a happy, healthy, productive life, I actually get nothing for that. I don't get an attaboy, I don't get a plaque, nothing. But if they go out and reoffend, I could get demoted, I could get fired, I look stupid in front of my coworkers because I'm, I'm a sap, because I took a chance on a person. You know, I mean, we're asking for like heroic stuff out of people and frankly, most people aren't heroes. Most people are just regular people and they want to make it to retirement and so, We've set this whole thing up. If you were to design a thing to produce the kind of, really kind of stupid stuff that we saw, like calling people in the middle of the night or violating people for missing appointments, if you, if you were designing something to result in that, you could hardly do better than the exact system we've designed right now. It seems like, according to this conversation, the, the default, if I'm an officer, is to say, I don't want the hassle of having you know issues i'd rather just you know violate the person you talked about we had a separate conversation where you talked about some experiences that are similar to what tanya is saying mm -hmm. can you share those with us you had a couple of people yeah. that you know about who were violated in some really horrible situations yeah i mean i've been now, now that i've been researching this and writing about it i you know more and more people are calling me and, yeah. and telling me stories and I, I researched them to find out if they're really true or not because mm -hmm. i don't want to say something out loud and not know that it's true, but you know, most people have heard now about the, 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 the killing of Nipsey Hussle, but what most people didn't hear about was when he got killed, he was donating clothing to a guy in a halfway house, right, mm -hmm. that was trying to find work, so the guy needed nice clothes, right? So this guy got shot right alongside Nipsey Hussle while he was receiving his donation. Mm -hmm. And he went to the hospital and his parole officer violated him and his violation was associating with a known gang member, and that was Nipsey Hussle. So while President Obama and Los Angeles Mayor Garcetti were eulogizing Nipsey Hussle and all the good work he did, his parole officer was violating for associating with Nipsey Hussle. Um, in New York, there was a, uh, a gentleman named Jose Rivera who was out on parole, and he had a substance abuse problem, he had a heroin addiction, uh, became homeless, stopped seeing his PO, ends up you know, being sick and going to Bellevue Hospital. While he's in Bellevue, his parole officer finds out about it and goes in and while the guy's on his deathbed, his parole officer finds it, files a technical violation on him. So again, why would, it, it, I guess it's tempting to think of parole officers as just indecent people. And I think that's a cop out because 
you always, I think, just like in any other behavior, you have to ask, why are people doing that? And I think people are doing that because we've set up this environment where if it's just completely risk averse and people just file a violation because that's the safe thing to do. And I'm not trying to excuse it by saying that. My point is we need to change the rules if we want the behavior to be different. Yeah, it sounds like you're saying we need to incentivize when people are doing the right thing yep. so that the officers are not worried and they, they do get a pat on the back for, for doing helping people you know, get off parole quick or, or, yep. or what have you. You also have an experience, Tanya, that's related to the ankle monitor and working that is pretty extraordinary that I think the viewers would, would um, yes. appreciate. Well, while I, I was hired as an outreach coordinator when I came, uh, when I came home, um, so my job was to go out, to go to the borough president's office, to go to different offices. Well, my employer had sent a letter to the uh, halfway house and told them that on this Monday that I would be going to pick up literature from the um, Barrel Pres President Office for a campaign that we were doing in Coney Island. Um, I went as I normally would do, go to work, I would check in at work, and then I left and I went to the Barrel President's Office. Well, the ankle monitor started buzzing and it started uh, buzzing and then it started alarming. Whoa. So it started buzzing and alarming. So I quickly gathered the materials and it tells you, and you have to call once it starts buzzing and alarming. Like making noise. Making noise on your leg. Your leg is shaking wow. and it's buzzing like a, like a phone mm. ringing. Um, that means you have to come, once it rings, it means you have to come to the halfway house immediately. Mm. So I, grabbed, I gathered the materials and I rush straight to the halfway house because that's what that sound means. Well, when I get in, um, the staff took me in, they put me in a room, and they told me that I was violating. I showed, I had a copy of the letter because I, you know, you learn to not trust certain mm -hmm. things. So I had the letter with me as well as the receipt that it was emailed, um, and I showed them. So what the staff did was they pulled on the screen and they pinpointed exactly where I was at the borough president's office on Joalaman Street. And that's where I was supposed to be, I told them. I said, you had the letter. She says, no, you can't, you can't do that. They started after that point. Um, I had to check in. I went back to work the next day. At that point, they kept calling my boss on his personal cell phone. Mm. Where is she? Even though at this point, my boss said, you can just come to the office and work. Just do your nine to five in the office. I won't send you out. Mm -hmm. Well, they started calling him on his cell phone personally. Where is she? What is she doing when I'm en route to work? And uh, three weeks later, he had to ask me to leave mm. because he was personally stressed out. Mm. So and you end up losing your job. I end up losing my job. Mm -hmm. um, so it's quite unfortunate that, that stuff like this happens. I mean, one of the, the issues that we talk about as an agency, too, is with all of these violations, Vinny, and so many people going back inside, it makes it look like all these people are bad. It's right. like, oh, they go to prison, they yep. come out, and they go back. That's right. But when you go back for a non-criminal offense, like not reporting right. for whatever reason or violating a curfew, some other non-criminal offense, it's like inflating these recidivism statistics. Right. That's right. Oh, 50, 60, you read a federal study, 67% of people recidivated in three years. Right. And these folks are thinking, everybody's going back to prison. That's Mostly right. everybody's going back to prison That's right. without the context. It's like, yep. no, people are going back for these really petty things. That's right. If you look at New York, yeah. parole, you, you think half of everybody comes back in three years for a new crime. No, half yeah. everybody comes back, but most of them, 80% of them, come back for not a new exactly. crime. So what do we do about this? I know you yeah. are working on some less yep. is more and, yep. and some other stuff. So yep. there's some legislation that, that uh, is going on in a bunch of different states, but also as a probation commissioner, I did a lot of stuff that wasn't legislative. You can just do stuff. There's a ton of discretion. But I'll talk about the legislation first. Basically what it says is, let's reduce the number of things for which you can be violated. Mm -hmm. When you get, if you do get violated, make, make it short, not a year. Mm -hmm. Let's make it a week. 
Like if we want to send a message to somebody, it doesn't take a year to get a message, make it a short period of time so maybe they could keep a job, right? Mm -hmm. And then that's the negative side. On the positive side, we're saying, if you have three years parole, incentivize people just like you do in jail and say, all right, for every 30 days you don't get a violation, you get 30 days off the end of your parole. So if you don't get ever, ever get a violation, you're done in 18 months. Because if people can string together 18 months of good behavior, chances are they're going to be fine after that. But then the most important part is how much money this costs. This costs $350 million to technical violators in New, just in New York. That's what the Lipman Commission found. Mm -hmm. And nationally, $2.8 billion on technical violations. If we could stop violating people, and capture that money and help purchase the kinds of things that they need, like housing and, and, and job training and education and substance abuse counseling and all the kind of stuff that the Fortune Society provides. If we could buy those kinds of services for people, then we wouldn't need to violate them. So, but we don't have that money now because we're spending it on prison. Yeah. And there was also a study, and it was in the Less Is More work, that Rikers, the only oh, yeah. population that's continuing to increase are people well, there for violence. technical parole violation, yep. right? Arrests are going down, everything else is going down, yep. but 15% higher uh, technical parole violation. And the city is complaining too because it's costing them over $100,000 to incarcerate each one of these individuals a yep. year. So that study was, was a study we did. It showed, yeah, that that's the only population going up. But then we started, again, hearing from around the state. And it was really interesting to hear what's going on in the rest of the state. Because mm -hmm. in other parts of the state, like in New York, every day they're having hearings. Yeah. And you have a legal aid lawyer. Mm -hmm. In the rest of the state, there's no representation. There's no right to representation. So a lot of people are just going into hearings by themselves. And in some places, they only have hearings once a month. So if you get violated the day after the hearing examiners are there, mm -hmm. you're waiting a month to even get your first hearing. Yeah. Um, and so like in Tompkins County, the sheriff signed on, the DA signed on, lots of people signed on because they have all these people sitting and waiting. Mm -hmm. And many times when they actually have the hearing, they either find out they didn't do it mm -hmm. or that it was not that big a deal, so they let them go back to the community. But meanwhile, they burned a month or three weeks or two weeks, whatever it is, just waiting for that hearing. Yeah, so people are losing jobs, they're losing... Yeah housing opportunities, et cetera, by going back in. And like you said, they're not going back in necessarily for a short period of time. They're right. going back in for a significant amount those, of time. And those amount of time, I mean, those weeks, those, those for folks that aren't rich, yes. even, by the way, for middle-class people, yeah. disappearing on your job for a couple of weeks, you could yeah. lose your job. Yeah, but certainly for poor people, they're not going to have housing, employment, yeah. lots yeah. of things go away in a couple of weeks. Yeah, and we have a couple of minutes left, but Tanya, I definitely want to hear you, you know, as someone who has this particular experience, what would you suggest in so far as change? Because there's a human cost, not just a financial cost to this. What, what, what would you just suggest in addition to some of the things that Vinny said that really needs, we need to do to change the system? I believe that you need to go in to the prisons when people are preparing to come home because people that are in prison preparing to come home are eager to come home and do right. Mm -hmm. Meet them at their need. Let the employer, employment agencies, uh, begin to discuss with people in, in CBOs uh, while they're there. So when they come home, the job opportunities are there to begin to start to reunify with the family and seek housing because that's what we do. When we're preparing to come home, once you know you're 30 days to come home, you are excited. Stop killing the joy. And that 25 percent of, of the the 25 of the 25 percent of the subsistence has to go. There's no money left. It's easier to go back and do your violation for a few months than to pay them the 25 percent. Because you think many people probably are not working because they don't want to pay the 25 percent, or because they, they can't afford they to, can't, they because can't. the amount is so small that they don't have anything the, left over. The average job is minimum wage, minimum even wage. at 15 dollars mm -hmm. an hour now in New York. That still is not enough because you have to pay for your own car fare. They no longer give you uh, laundry money. You cannot do your laundry. There's there's nothing left once you give 125 dollars a week out of yeah. pretext money. So, Vinny, we have two minutes or so left. We want to talk about exit sure. as, before we exit? Sure, mm -hmm. that's great. 
Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of people that are in these systems that are working in these systems, not, not just advocates, not just people on probation, but people running these systems believe what I just said, that it should be smaller, more focused, and more rehabilitative. And in August, we launched EXIT, which is Executives Transforming Probation and Parole, which is 60 uh, probation and parole commissioners who say, let's make it smaller, let's make it more rehabilitative, let's not violate so many people, kind of like the Less is More Act in New York, which mm -hmm. didn't pass last year, but we hope is going to pass this year. So it's not, this is mainstream thought amongst people in the field, and now we just have to get policies and practices to follow alongside. Right. Having administrators involved is clearly critical because you, you, know, you have district attorneys, you have administrators, having them on the side of this. Because you know some people are like, oh, you think about corrections, it's like, we don't want to close jails, we don't want to close prisons, even if it's nonsensical for them to stay open. So, right. But thank you for doing that because sure. getting all these folks to be committed to saying less is more, we think is something that's really important. So yeah. thank you for that. Thank you, thank you uh, Tanya, for your contribution thank and you. for trying to bring some sense to these kind of psychedelic um, policies. So this, it was great to have you. Thank it was you. great to have you too, Vinny. Thank you. Um, we look forward to continuing the conversation. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So it appears that that's all the time we have for today. Thank you both for the extremely important perspectives and thought-provoking insight you share here today. To our national audience, especially people watching from behind the walls, I found today's episode interesting and perhaps a call to action to mobilize around parole reform issues in your jurisdiction. If you're interested in finding out more about the Fortune Society, please visit our website at thefortunesociety.org or visit us on Facebook by typing in the Fortune Society. This is Ronald F. Day, and I appreciate you joining us as we critically look at both sides of the bars. Mm -hmm.